I'm really just the warm-up act for being a 48 here, but I do want to share a few, just a few comments with you, a few reflections. Uh, the first being implicit in my subtitle there, Appropriating Personhood for Different Purposes. So personhood is being appropriated for many purposes, and the real question is whether it's a robust enough notion to do all the things that uh, various groups want it to do. We spent all of yesterday trying to justify why it was adequate for at least acquiring rights for some animals. Uh, and we've spent today starting to question whether there are some other issues that arise with personhood or other concerns that come into play. About a month ago, uh, oh, but the one thing that nearly all of the different movements toward personhood have in common is they are trying to seek certain kinds of rights, protections, and responsibilities for different groups. And we have a long history of that. Men without property, indentured servants. Most of us forget that uh, maybe 48% of the men and people in general in the colonies at the time of the American Revolution were indentured servants. The Constitution only granted um, citizenship to a minority of citizens. But I think Steve's gone into that pretty well, so I don't have to really cover all that. So slaves, women, non-Christians. So on and on, it's kind of a never-ending struggle, isn't it, for one group after another getting rights or protections that they don't presently have. About a month ago, I was, I was uh, in Ottawa at a conference, and I spent one morning walking around the Capitol building of Canada. And of course, the Capitol building is surrounded by all these male sculptures, the prime ministers of Canada. But way over on the right side, there was this collection of five female, um, this grouping of five female sculptures, the Alberta's Famous Five. And I'm going to direct you to what they're all looking at. They're looking at this woman who is holding a newspaper that says women are persons. It's commemorating a decision on October 18, 1929, um, where the Privy Council of England, which actually oversaw Canada, Canada was still within the government of the UK at that time, overrode a decision by the Canadian Supreme Court that a reference to persons in the, in the Senate only applying to men. And it said, no, it applies to women. Well, this is nothing new for any of us. But as we all perhaps know now, is certain forms of, of rights for women are being challenged by the very notion of personhood. This poster happens to be for a somewhat different event that was held at Harvard. It was a panel about uh, back in March. And you can see how they just framed the question somewhat differently than we are, and yet they're talking about some of the same subjects we are here today. But in our framing, we didn't attract a lot of people who think that personhood is largely about the rights of the fetus. The fetus has been mentioned a couple times, but that's perhaps the strongest personhood movement in America at this time. And any other um, personhood discussion we're having is really second to that when you think of our broader political context. Interestingly enough, the right to life movement has not been oblivious to the fact that we do in this country grant the rights as a legal per oh, excuse me. Okay. The rights of legal person to corporations. So this discomfort with corporations having personhood is not just something that, that lies with the left or liber libertarians, but also with the with the right to life movement. It's been controversial from the get-go. Was pretty much commemorated by a Supreme Court decision of the trustees of Dartmouth College versus Woodward, and has which has built upon establishing more and more rights for corporations. Now, a lot of us today are very critical of corporations being legal persons. And we see a lot of damage being done to our democracy because of that. But we often forget that the granting of personhood to corporations opened up 
a vast realm of protections that allowed the speeding up of the industrial revolution, the germ theory revolution in medicine, the sanitation revolution, um, the education revolution, all kinds of things that we are quite pleased to have now perhaps would not have happened if these protections had not been given to corporations. In 1888, the Supreme Court decided that corporations were persons under the 14th Amendment, which has largely been created to establish rights of citizenship for free slaves. But they more or less have, even in an earlier decision, stated that they took this for granted, that corporations should also have these rights of citizenship. And it wasn't really until 1906 that the Supreme Court started to turn back and look at limitations that they might introduce on the rights of corporations. Now, I'm best known for mapping a new field of inquiry known as machine ethics and machine morality. And those of you on, on the animal side of the equation might be interested to know who my co-author was. That's Colin Allen, who's well known for his work on on animal studies, one of the leading philosophers, naturalistic philosophers looking at what is the implications of various research with animals. The notion of our book was largely what were the prospects for creating artificial agents capable of being moral agents, artificial moral agents. Could they make moral decisions? And if so, what would be the criteria upon which they could, be, they could be designed to make moral decisions? If we could design robots that are sensitive to ethical considerations and factor those into their choices and actions, then that opens up vast new realms for their adoption. On the other hand, if you can't do it, if they can't accommodate human laws and values in their decisions, then there's going to be all kinds of demands for regulations that limit their use. The subtext of all this is, well, how do humans do it? How do we really make moral decisions? And what are all the different kinds of faculties, capabilities, knowledge that come into, come into play that make us moral actors? Because of my involvement in the robotics issue, I've constantly been invited to conferences and presentations where people talk about right, robots as legal persons. What grounds would, it, would uh, we give them rights of citizens, as has been just alluded to in our previous conversation. I'm not going to go into this in any detail, largely because I'm lucky that Shamir is going to uh, follow with the presentation this afternoon, and I'm sure he's going to talk about this much more than I will. But it often turns on whether you want to give this a more utilitarian or deontological turn. If it's utilitarianism, perhaps you would say, well, they can't really be citizens unless they can feel pleasure and pain. But so far, our robotic at platforms don't even have any form of emotions that we would consider phenomenological in any way. Or the deontological turn is more toward what capabilities would they have to have? Would they need consciousness, emotions, a theory of mind, empathy, moral intelligence? Generally, most of the legal scholars have more or less agreed that if they had consciousness, that they had true phenomenal consciousness, it would be pretty hard for the existing law to deny them personhood, at least in theory. But then there's this other school of thought going on, and that's the singularitarians. And what the singularity initially meant, what, as it was proposed by the science fiction writer and mathematician Werner Vinge, was a time when human intelligence equaled, excuse me, when computer intelligence equaled and then exceeded human intelligence. And at that point, there would also be an intelligence explosion, an idea he had derived from I.J. Good, that would have the machines vastly superior to humans in just a few short computer generations, depending on how long you think a computer generation is. And the big issue around that is, well, how soon will it come, and will they be friendly to humans or unfriendly to humans if we have these, uh, these kinds of computers? Marvin Minsky has said, perhaps they'll keep us around as the equivalent of house pets. <laughs> But the big issue is often, how soon will it happen? And some people are predicting it could happen in 20, 30, 40 years. I'm on record as your friendly skeptic. 
I am skeptical that we really know enough about intelligence or that the platforms we are now putting in place to create artificial intelligence and science are adequate to produce the kinds of faculties discrimination that is implied by this form of singularity. But I am friendly to the can-do engineering spirit that says we can make some pretty remarkable things happen. Part of my skepticism is because I just don't buy into this argument of a technological determinism or a technological inevitability. There are notions out there like uh, computational theory of mind and a law of acceleration that would suggest that, well, this could happen very quickly. I think, the, I think there's some flaws in the laws, but I also don't think that anything is inevitable. The course of technology depends very heavily on our buy-in. We bought into the space program. We didn't buy into the International Space Station. And that's why we don't have an International Space Station. Even though Walt Disney and Werner von Braun promised me a vacation on that International Space Station when I was a teenager. But there are going to be other factors that are going to intervene, such as whether we really want to create entities that are superior to ourselves. And is it ethical to introduce pain and suffering into the artificial entities we create? Are we going to need IRBs for research on robotics if somebody tries to introduce pain and suffering into them? But I'm deeply concerned about an issue that I think is already a problem for us and will increasingly be a problem, and that's autonomous robotic systems which threaten to undermine the foundational principle that human agents, either individual or corporate, are corporate are responsible and potentially accountable and liable for the harms caused by the deployment of any technology. The principle of human responsibility is not changed by the advent of increasingly autonomous systems, but the nature of their complexity, unpredictability, and other factors will make it more and more difficult to attribute blame culpability, liability when something goes wrong. And there will be like moves for no fault insurance for, let's say, self-driving cars. And this will erode the basic principle of responsibility, which I think is essential to any notion of personhood or at least legal personhood. How about these creatures? What are we going to do about them? This is some artist rendering. a hybrid of a pig and a human. From our animal rights perspective, these plaintive figures are certainly worthy of rights, aren't they? On the other hand, these creatures are most likely to be created, or something like these creatures will be created for research purposes. Because as noted in this conference, scientists are becoming quite aware that, the, that our use of animals as research platforms for, let's say, human drug research they're just poor models, but these would be much better models, wouldn't they? Furthermore, the pig is the best source for organs for human transplantation. Going to be a lot of pressure to create organisms like this to solve the transplant problem. I'm sorry Martine Rothblatt isn't here. I have tremendous respect for Martine, and one of her projects is to create an artificial lung using a pig model. She's also trying to create an artificial lung using stem cell research. So she's not just focusing on xenotransplants, but there again is another ethical issue that has to be debated out. Some people are very uncomfortable with putting pig organs in human beings, and yet we are already using certain um, tissues and other materials from pigs for transplantations. And if you really want to dissolve this distinction between humans and animals, well, where do you stand on the xenotransplant issue? <coughs> Martine came up with another concept known as the beeman. And her be in the beeman was her term for entities such as the cryogenically frozen, what she would call humans in biostasis, or people who had uploaded their minds into computers and machines. Now, whether you think we're ever going to be able to defrost 
those who are cryogenically frozen and bring them back to life, or whether you think that that's really a life form if you try and upload your mind into a machine. That may be secondary to the question of, should they have legal rights? And why are you granting them legal rights? And that's clearly her main drive to grant them legal rights. So what is the right, let's say, of all these cryogenically frozen brains, heads and bodies, such as Ted Williams, if, if um, Alcor, the leading cryogenics firm, goes bankrupt? Do they have any right to preservation? So these are the kinds of issues we're getting into. They are largely thought experiments at this time, as are the questions about the rights for robots. Again, I think a lot of these technologies are more far off in the distance than they are often being represented. There's much more complexity than is fully being taken responsibility for in realizing any of these things. But I could be wrong. This gentleman, this dreadlock gentleman, is actually a card-carrying member of the Technogliterati. His name is Jerome Lanier. Um, Jerome is famous because he coined the term virtual reality and brought into being one of the first virtual reality um, companies. But more recently, he is noted because he's actually taking most of his technological buddies to task in books like You Are Not a Gadget and Who Owns the Future. He's largely saying that the technologists are selling humanity short. So he's, uh, he's actually quite a fascinating person. But we talked about the circle of inclusion. Uh, my Laurie, uh, Laurie Gruen went into it a little bit yesterday. Jerome's one of the people who is against our expanding the cir circle of inclusion in terms of who is actually designated a human. And Partially why he's against it is he's concerned about demeaning human rights that may take place through that process of delusion. I don't think he's totally incorrect on that. I'm actually quite concerned by what I see as a pathologizing of human nature, a kind of coming out of the kinds of scientific information we use both to justify the animal rights movement and to justify some transhumanism. Science, by its very nature, well, it's not always reductionistic, but that's one of its most functional methods to look at, at organisms, both human and non-human organisms, in terms of their individual mechanisms. We have these languages that we are evolved animals, that we are flawed machines. Those aren't scientific. Those aren't scientific languages, but those languages get appropriated from science as we try and move forward the various social agendas we have. And that causes me a bit of concern. I think we are perhaps selling what it means to be a human being a little bit short, in the same way as we're selling short the remarkable qualities that many of the animals we've been talking about over the past 36 hours have. So let me just finish up with just a final precautionary note. Human exceptionalism at the expense of other beings worthy of moral considerations is immoral. And yet we humans are still truly remarkable creatures. And human exceptionalism isn't about to disappear, no matter how much we want to say that philosophically Darwin has trumped it or that uh, you know, there's a recognition among at least those of us in the animal rights circle that the playing field has been leveled. And I get deeply concerned when in the pursuit of personhood for either non-human animals or post-humans, we start to demean what it means to be a person. Thank you very much.